Welcome to the Biblical Languages Podcast, brought to you by Biblingo. My name is Nick Mesmer, and I'm here with my co-host, Kevin Grosso. In this episode, we're asking the question, do we really need exegesis? Really quickly before we dive into this episode, I just wanted to mention we're offering a holiday discount for 30% off a subscription to Biblingo. So if you're interested in that, you can check it out at biblingo.org slash holidays. We'll put the link in the description to this episode as well. So let's uh, let's get started with this topic. This topic kind of came up based on, I think, two observations that we've made about the field of biblical languages. The first one is that the ultimate objective of learning Greek and Hebrew seems to be exegesis. So when you're talking to people in the field or, again, looking at resources or courses or whatever, the ultimate objective of learning Greek and Hebrew seems to be being able to do exegesis. And along with that is kind of a second observation that there seems to be an assumption that the grammar translation method is better than the communicative approach for this objective. So we've kind of talked about the distinction in these approaches quite a lot in previous episodes. And with that, we kind of have a two-part question for this episode. Number one, does the grammar translation method or the communicative approach help us do exegesis better? And the second question is, should exegesis be our ultimate objective in the first place um, for learning Greek and Hebrew? So with that, I think uh, an important starting point is what do we even mean by exegesis, Um, right? It's kind of a key element to these questions. So in a, a previous series, a series we did on biblical language pedagogy, we made a distinction between three activities that seem to be conflated a lot. And those are reading, translating, and exegesis. So can you just very briefly break down that distinction for us once again, and then we can kind of dive into exegesis specifically? Yeah, so I think when we look at this, these three activities, one of the first things that is really obvious is that everyone knows what reading is normally, and everyone knows what translating is normally, and exegesis if you ask someone what that means on the street, they're going to, you know, not have any idea what you mean. <laughs> so so I think th- the reason why that's important is in some ways exegesis is what we want it to mean. And and that's a, a crucial point because it, it's a it's it is a scholarly construct that we've kind of created. And so that's different than reading, right? If if someone is reading a text, we know what they're doing, right? They are looking at the words and they're gathering meaning from it and they're doing so in a way that you know they're not stopping every other word and looking up you know what what that means right It, it just in our normal you know english language right we would say that that is you know reading right translating likewise right is is very intuitive for us we know what that means you take one text or speech in one language and you you know copy the meaning into another language right and you convey that try to convey that same meaning from the tar- from the source language in the target language so so we have a, a very good idea of what it means to read and what it means to translate so exegesis you know is something that you know although people say it's the goal, it's rarely defined very precisely. And, and what that means is, I mean, I think, I think at the end of the day, what what people actually want is they want meaning, right? That what they want to understand the original text in the way that it was meant to be understood. Right? So, so, and they view exegesis as the, means by which they can get to the meaning right either that or you know uh an explication of the meaning itself right so just being able to explain that meaning that that overlaps with reading and translating right because if i'm going to read a text and if i'm you know truly reading it i am comprehending its meaning and if i'm translating a text i first have to understand 
you know, the meaning of the source text in order to convey that same meaning in another language, right? So, so all three have to do with meaning. And so the question, you know, that, that we're looking at is what is exegesis then? How is it different than reading? And, and if it's not different than reading, why do we need it? If it is different than reading, you know, then, then what are its, its distinctive features? Right, right. And that, yeah, that I think is really helpful. Um, I do think if, if you ask, not your average person on the, on the sidewalk, but, you know, someone more in this world, what exegesis is, a lot of people will kind of go to like a kind of um, etymological definition of it, where it's like drawing out the meaning, kind of breaking it down. Um, and and that, yeah, that that definition of like drawing out the meaning or or it's uh, c- contrasted with exegesis. Um, so it's kind or of eisegesis, po- depending or on eisegesis, your eisegesis, yeah, <laughs> de- depending on your pronunciation of the Greek. Yeah. Um, so the the distinction there is exegesis is getting at the audience, uh, not the, the author's intended meaning, whereas eisegesis, eisegesis is kind of reading your own meaning into it, right? But either way, the the idea is trying to understand the what you might call the original meaning of the text. Um, and yeah, the, the problem with that definition is it does kind of beg the question, how is that different than reading? Right. So if you, if you had, I like to ask this question really to myself, but others as well. If I, if we had, a you know, teenager from the ancient world who was fluent in, you know, Koine Greek, but had no training in, you know, grammar or anything like that. And then you have, say, someone highly trained in what we would kind of consider like exegetical skill, uh, but a 21st century, you know, native English speaker who can't read Greek fluently. Like, who would you rather uh, explain the meaning of the New Testament text to you? And it's a difficult question, but I mean, I I think it would be difficult to not answer the teenager, you know, Um, because they would just have these intuitions and they would be able to, yeah, just deal with the text so differently. So that, again, that begs the question of who, who's, who is able to get at the meaning better and faster and more efficiently. Right. Um, and it seems that the person who can read better, um, would have an advantage in that area. So yeah, when you define exegesis in that kind of more, um, broad sense of just trying to get at the meaning of the text, uh, it doesn't really seem that advantageous over and above reading. So there are ways, however, of talking about exegesis that I think um, do get at its unique contribution, like you mentioned. So I have just a few definitions here um, that we can look at. So the first one is from the Anchor Yale Bible Dictionary. They define exegesis as the process of careful analytical study of the Bible to produce useful interpretations of those passages. So that seems to be a bit different than how we defined reading. Um, in, in what ways would you say it's unique? Yeah, so it is kind of different, right? I mean, even even something like this, like, you know, can you, if you read carefully, is it really that different? And then, right. I mean, I, I mean, I think part of the, okay, so just to look at this, to break this down, right? To read this more carefully, right? <laughs> it's, it's a process. So, so it is an activity that we do, right? Um, and it involves careful analysis, right? So, so it is true that like when I'm, when I'm just reading through a text, right? I'm, I'm usually not like carefully analyzing everything right um now now that could be because i am just intuiting it all correctly and honestly if i'm really good at the language like when i'm doing that with english i'm just not i don't really care how i would describe a particular genitive because i just know what it means right and so so whether or not you know, i mean and in, in some cases Right, it is sort of like on the fence, and it would be helpful for me to stop and say, "I wonder, you know, what what really is the relationship between these two words, right?" But most of the time, you know, we're pretty good at just running through a text and just getting the meaning, right? And in fact, 
sometimes when you when you go too slowly, when you're too careful, you end up missing the larger picture, right? When I'm too careful about what this genitive means, I, I may end up forgetting, you know, what Paul was talking about in, you know, Romans 1, for example, if I'm looking now at Romans 5, right? Um, but but if I'm just, you know, that letter was read as a letter and all together, right? And so whoever the original audience was had the, those two, um, you know, had the whole letter in their heads, right? As as they were working through the text. So, so I think, you know, there is a sense in which, you know, again, these two things do overlap, but there is a sense in which it isn't normal to, to, to read texts like this. It isn't normal to, you know, carefully analyze, um, you know, these kinds of things. But, but the issue, right, is the, the goal, and this is what the Anchor Bible Dictionary says, right, to produce useful interpretations of those passages, right? And so, yeah, if, if I already have the useful interpretation, the correct interpretation, right, it, if I'm able to just read through it and intuit it because I know the language, then I don't really need the, you know, to stop every single word and, and parse it and like, you know, give a, a very analytical study of that word because I already have the interpretation that I'm going after. I think um, one way to, to look at this is insofar as our goal is getting the meaning of the text. Um Reading is basically the the closer you are to native speaker fluency, the more adequate reading is as an activity to get the meaning, right? Um, and I think one way to look at exegesis is the further away you are from that native speaker fluency, the more you can kind of fill in those gaps with exegesis, right? So you, you come across a word that you either don't know or maybe you do know it but you don't have the same intuitions about it as a native speaker and so maybe you're not getting the full picture something that we would consider exegesis like a word study right that's where that comes in you know same thing with any kind of grammatical construction basically where you lack intuitions um, that careful analytical study can come and and fill in the gaps i think there are linguistic analogies here that are are really helpful as I'm as we're just having this conversation. I'm thinking of all these ways in in which um, just all these parallels. So you know, for example, I can talk about the meaning of you know a particular morpheme, let's say in Chinese, right? Um, I don't I don't want to say like I mean, well I can say guo, you know, and and I know if you're a Chinese speaker, I'm pronouncing it wrong, but but this is like an aspect marker um, in in Chinese, and I like having a linguistics background, I can tell you, you know, if you give me like an instance of guo and you like translate all the words around it, um, I can probably tell you what it means, right? Um, because I have some idea of, you know, the literature on on what they say about it, right? Um, and then I can, you know, I just know there are certain principles, right, for interpreting for interpreting these kinds of aspect markers. And so then I can say like, okay, this is probably what it means in this case, right? Um, and so, by developing, you know, sort of robust linguistic intuitions, right? We can, um, like you said, kind of fill in those in those gaps, right? At the end of the day, I think, and then this is to your point, the authority on what it means is the native speaker, right? And so I would be checked by, you know, a Chinese person who who just uses that morpheme all the time and has never done any analysis, right? And and I would just say, you know, do you understand this by, you know, this morpheme in this case, right? And they would say yes or no, right? <laughs> and determine if I was correct in my analysis. The problem with, with you know, obviously our text is that we have no native speakers, but the closer, as you say, the closer we can get to having genuine intuitions about the text, and you can, right? Like, like we can develop intuitions about languages that are not our own, right? And we can develop accurate intuitions about those languages. We can't be native speakers, right? We can't be to the point where, you know, we are the quote-unquote authority on what the text 
means, right? Um, but but we can get to the point where we can we can reasonably exclude interpretations because we have intuitions that are good enough to say no, this is this is just not how this is just not how this construction works, right? Um, you just never see this kind of thing, right? And in order to get there, you you really have to just read a, a whole lot of texts and and be familiar enough with the language to where you know it's just starting to to live inside of you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you know, I want to I want to come back to this idea of of native speaker fluency and intuitions and all of that. I think I think it might be worth making just one quick clarification at this point. Um just see, as we talk about exegesis, um you know, we're we're talking specifically about Greek and Hebrew exegesis or, you know, exegesis in so far as it involves the languages. Obviously, uh, exegesis as a discipline is much broader and more holistic and interdisciplinary than that. You know, you can uh, do exegesis at the at the level of you know cultural, historical context, and you know rhetorical, literary, canonical levels. So you know, there's much more to it than than Greek and Hebrew. But and, and you know, I don't think we're necessarily saying you can build intuitions about all, all of these sorts of things. I mean, probably to some degree you can, but our, the, the, the point being um, we're, you know, specifically talking about Greek and Hebrew exegesis. Um, and so asking the question, do we even need exegesis? We're, we're not really talking about those other things that are, you know, absolutely necessary for, for a, a good understanding of the text. So just wanted to, to throw that out there just because I know we're, in, in a certain sense, using exegesis kind of narrowly uh, to refer to just Greek and Hebrew. So, um, yeah, so so with that, back to just talking about native speaker um, intuitions, I think another thing we can't <clears throat> overlook is that, you know, exegesis can't, is, isn't just filling in the gaps where our native speaker intuition, where we lack native speaker intuitions, um, because I think we have to admit that even native speakers of these languages um, did exegesis, you know, uh, even language exegesis in, in, in certain ways. So, you know, there are there are instances where um, even for a native speaker, there are ambiguities in the text, and uh, you can go through a, a an exegesis process as a native speaker to disambiguate between multiple possible and even probable interpretations of a text. You know, we we do this in normal, casual, you know, interactions with with other native speakers of our native languages. When when there's misunderstanding or again ambiguity, you know, there's there's little micro exegesis going on to to clarify. But you know, then with texts, like uh, even more so with texts, there there are are times where we have to go through some sort of exegetical process, even with our native language, to um, to disambiguate when maybe there's a word that can have multiple meanings, or there's a construction that can be interpreted in multiple ways, or, or whatever. Um, so, so I would say, you know, um, even beyond uh, filling in the gaps of where we lack native speaker intuitions, I think exegesis also can um, can help us disambiguate even where we have intuitions, um, but where those intuitions are, are simply insufficient for um, to really getting to to the meaning that we're looking for. So, you know, with that, just thinking of these basic definitions of exegesis, um, the question of do we do we really need exegesis to get the meaning um, of the text? I think we're answering not necessarily. Uh, reading, just the activity of reading can get us, potentially get us all the way there, depending on our intuitions and, and really how ambiguous or or not ambiguous the text is, right? Um, but do we really need exegesis to get the meaning? Sometimes it's yes, if where we lack intuitions or where there just is genuine amb ambiguity in the text. Um, but just going back to this definition, uh, you know, to provide useful interpretations. I think that piece to produce useful interpretations. I mean, that also begs the question what do you mean by useful, useful right? Right. That? <laughs> and but I, I think maybe it, it gets at uh kind of another um contribution of exegesis and and so another uh, definition I think is helpful here. So this one's from Oxford the Oxford Learner's Dictionary. 
it just defines exegesis as the detailed explanation of a piece of writing, usually religious writing. So here it's emphasis on the explanation. Um, and so I think if that's what you mean by useful interpretation, like it's it's useful in the sense that you can share it with someone else, right? Or something like that. Um, then that, that makes sense. And so um, in fact, I have another kind of unpacking that definition a little bit more. So th- this is actually a definition um, that our friend Kaspars put on Twitter and actually kind of summarizing our, our podcast series on biblical language pedagogy, but I thought it was really great. So he defined exegesis as, and I modified it slightly, a reasoned justification of a particular interpretation r- regarding the meaning of a given text using metalanguage um, or kind of grammatical categories or something like that. So Right, the idea here is you're presupposing that you've arrived at some meaning and, you know, in theory, you could have arrived there just by reading, right, without what we might call exegesis. But then you're giving a reason, justification for why you understood it in the way that you did. Um, and, and, you know, justification here, it doesn't necessarily have to be you're like justifying it to someone else. It could just be reflecting on it yourself. Like, why did I understand it that way, right? Why did I respond to it in a particular way? And the way that you do that, whether it's with someone else or with yourself, is using meta language or categories that we've created as a field, right? So, um, yeah, kind of taking a step back again, like you can you can include getting the meaning of a text in your definition of exegesis, or you can presuppose it in your definition of exegesis. Um, but either way, the point is that reading, being able to read with a measure of fluency can really get you a lot of that meaning uh, before you do anything that you would really consider exegesis. Well, and I think this is where, you know, it's actually closer to translating. So if you if you think about, so with reading, I don't have to explain the meaning that I get from the text, right? I, and in fact, I can get a meaning from the text that is correct, that I struggle to explain, right? And and maybe even after I explain it, someone else understands it differently than I do, right? So so in that case, you know, I, I might have the correct meaning and whoever I try to explain that meaning to might now have the incorrect meaning because my explanation was poor, right? And so, so if we focus on that part, that part is actually more like translating. So in translating, what you have to do, you, you presuppose that you know the meaning of the text, right? You have to know the meaning of the text. And then really the, the, the you know, really hard part about translating is getting, conveying that same meaning in a different language, right? But, but it presupposes we've already read it correctly, right? And so that's really, you know, the this the two options for for how we understand and do exegesis is are we going for just the meaning, right? And really, I don't think that's the case. I mean, I think most of the time people, I mean, yes and no, right? So like, if if as a teacher, what I want my students to be able to do at the end of the course, right, is you know, quote unquote, exegesis, meaning they can read the Greek or Hebrew text and understand what the author is saying, right? Then that is, you know, reading, right? That's just, I, I, so, you know, at that point, we don't really need exegesis, right? What you need, what you want the students to be able to do is read the text, right? And comprehend the meaning. Now, if we, if we look at like exegesis as explaining the meaning, right? That means that it presupposes we've already come to the correct interpretation. And then now we're trying to give some, you know, um, useful explanation, right? At this point, we, we have to really like use our tools to, to, you know, our meta language, right? To describe the meaning in a way that is clear for our audience, right? And we have to have justification for the meaning that we got from the text. And that justification might be incorrect, right? Um, even if our meaning is correct. So, 
and 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 I think that's where you know again just drawing this um, or just using an analogy based on really linguistics literature. So when when you analyze a word, actually the the one that comes to mind is Malka, um, who we interviewed for the Lexical Semantics series. She has a a pretty extensive analysis of the word drown in English. And if you were to ask most people on the street, you know, like, what, what, do you know what the word drown means? They would probably tell you yes, right? And if you read the paper, it's like, oh, maybe I actually didn't know what drown means, right? Um, but, but the, the issue is that we, we do intuit it in context, right? We intuit it very easily and we know what it means, right? But then if you ask someone to explain the contribution of drown, they will probably flounder and drown. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was a bad one. But, but, but really, it's, it's, it's much, much more difficult than, mm-hmm. than just saying, you know, all, you know, dying by uh, being in water, right? Because that, that definition doesn't fit for all kinds of, you know, ex- uses. So she has examples like, you know, my, my salad is, is drowning in oil, right? Um, there's no dying that happen- happens, right? There's all, you know, there's all kinds of these other uses of drown, right, that we don't typically think of. And so so the the issue is that, you know, explaining the meaning of drown is a much harder thing than just getting the meaning in a particular context, right? And, th- and that's similar to what's happening with exegesis, right? When you a- have to actually explain something, you have to be very, very careful about, you know, why this thing means what it does in this particular case. Yeah, yeah. So I want to bring this back to the methodologies of grammar translation method and the communicative approach. So the grammar translation method is typically seen as a better way to to do exegesis because it gives you those uh, grammatical categories right that that you can use to talk about the text and and things like that so i think kind of what we where we're at is we're saying that those those categories are not actually all that helpful when it comes to that first step of just getting the meaning of the text like you don't need those right again the closer you are to native speaker fluency you don't need them because i'm a native or there are plenty of native speakers of english who don't know those categories at all and they still understand english texts really 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 well right so and they can even explain them right they can even do that second step of explaining it to someone else and that can communicate successfully right right yeah yeah that's a good point and so um, the point is that a lot of the things that we would as- kind of associate with exegesis that we get from a grammar translation method, like parsing, trans, what we kind of call translating, um, you know, using grammatical categories and things like that, even kind of diagramming, you know, texts and things like that. Again, if you develop reading fluency, a lot of that you just understand intuitively right and so you can just kind of skip a lot of it and so that in that sense the communicative approach which is specifically geared toward reading fluency um is much more useful for that part of exegesis if you include that and you're getting the meaning in your definition of exegesis right so yeah the point here is if again if you if you use the communicative approach to develop reading fluency then things like parsing you know, basic wooden translations, even diagramming the text, things like that just become, are rendered unnecessary because you intuit them. At least not as necessary. Not as necessary, right. I I think along those same lines, I, part of the issue is, you know, part of the rebuttal against communicative approaches is to say, well, you're not preparing them for for exegesis if they can just speak the language, right? And the reason why that's said is because you're not teaching them the meta language, right? Because exegesis is done in a certain meta language. So if you don't know what a dative is, right, you can't explain what a dative does, right? Mm-hmm. But the issue is, 
I actually can know what a dative does without knowing what a dative is, right? And I can actually know it much better by practicing using the dative in the correct way. And that's developing those kinds of intuitions are going to go a lot further than memorizing all the ways in which a dative can be used, you know, from Wallace's textbook, right? I mean, that's just the, the reality is, is that when I, when I, when, when someone would encounter a dative in the text who was a native speaker of Koine, they were not going through all the categories and deciding which one it was, right? They just knew what it meant because they knew, you know, how datives are used with these kinds of verbs and how it's used in this sort of syntactic construction. And, you know, they're reading the context into it and all of these things, right? All of these calculations that are done in milliseconds, they're able to do, right? To get at the meaning better than we can, right? Um, and so, so if we can get closer to that, right? That that's that's the whole idea. Now, what what you're saying is, we also need, I mean, and I think this is helpful, right? Um, we also need that meta language, right? It is actually helpful to to be able to talk about a dative and to to talk about all the ways it can be used, right? I mean, anyone, again, and I think I've said this before, anyone who's talked to me for like five minutes knows that I'm just like, you know, the nerdiest grammar person that you'll probably ever meet, right? And and, and and I personally think that even the grammar translation method that we're employing needs a major overhaul, right, in a lot of what we do because we're not using the linguistic terminology a lot of times in the correct way or, you know, the linguistics field has, you know, devoted tons of energy to, for example, what the dative means, right? And that really isn't being taken into consideration um, in our in our textbooks, not nearly to the extent that it should be. But but the 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 issue, right, is that the people who espouse the grammar translation method basically make exegesis about doing the grammar translation method. Right? right. It's 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 taking their terminology and using that terminology in the way that they they think it should be used, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and that's where you know it's 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 very circular, right? right? Um, and 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 I think that's that's kind of the the trouble we have with it. Right, right, yeah. That kind of going back to the definition of careful analytical study, right? Definition of exegesis. It's kind of that is just being defined as these sorts of things that we consider grammar translation method or like is the the careful analytical study of exegesis right but you, you have to ask the question of you know what use what what um end is that getting you to and are there better better ways of getting to that end right than than spe the specific activities we we learn through the grammar translation method and, and and with that something that's really interesting that i've i've found recently just looking at research in the field of second language acquisition is that there are really substantial benefits that you can get through the communicative approach developing your your reading comprehension and fluency abilities um, things that that you that people typically i think associate with the grammar translation method i mean a, a common objection to the communicative approach is that it's quote unquote weak in grammar and if you can get past the whole meta language issue and understand that there's a way of being strong in grammar apart from the meta language um then I think you can really start to see even more of the benefits of the communicative approach and, and what what reading comprehension and fluency really get you. And anyway, I, I think those things really come through um, in, in some of the research I've been looking at. So I want to quickly just run through three studies that I found really fascinating. And I'll link these in the show notes. I'm going to move through them quickly, but I, I, I do think they're worth sharing. So um, the first one, is, basically they're... they're finding their takeaway is that what what they considered good readers had a higher sensitivity to s syntactic and semantic features of the text than poor readers right so they had kind of pre-measured the good versus the poor readers and then they tested them on sensitivity to syntactic and semantic features basically what that means they they 
they took sentences and they manipulated them. Um, they say at the verb position, either semantically or syntactically. So they, they changed the verb that was used or they changed the syntax of it, uh, it um, to create an error. Uh, and uh, so, so that the sentence no longer really made sense in the way that it should. And so then they had these good readers and poor readers read these sentences aloud. And what happened is the good readers would try to correct um, the error that they came across right on the spot spontaneously. As they were reading, they would kind of fumble and try to correct the semantic or syntactic error. Whereas poor readers, again, people who had been pre-measured to, to not have strong reading comprehension and fluency ability, um, they would just read straight through the error as though it, it weren't there. And what's really interesting is that they also um, they tested the good readers and poor readers on their ability to what they call decode these words in isolation. So like, did do they know the meaning uh, of these words and how they work in isolation? And they actually tested similarly. Um, so it's it's only when these words were were in context that the good readers uh, you know demonstrated this this sensitivity to the semantic and syntactic features. So you know the question is. Why does that matter? What does that have to do with exegesis? The point is not that, you know, they can correct errors. Good readers can correct errors better than poor readers. The point, you know, what's behind this ability to correct errors on the fly is, again, sense linguistic sensitivity, sensitivity to things, again, that we that that have to do with grammar. Um, so so as you're reading if you're a good reader, as you're reading, you have sensitivities, you have expectations, you have what, you know, we keep talking about intuitions. And, and so when you encounter certain constructions, again, we're not anticipating you encountering errors in the biblical text, but maybe things that you didn't expect, right? Um, a, fla a flag is going to go up if you're a good reader. And that's where, again, the exegesis really can come in once you once you've already used your reading to get the the overall meaning and then identify points where there are interesting things going on um that that's you know that's the kind of grammatic the, the strong grammar skills that i know i i would prefer to have um and then from that do exegesis in a more meaningful way right whereas if you're a poor reader but even have you know, strong grammar in the in the sense of knowing the meta language and all of that, you could breeze right through the interesting things in the text because you don't have those intuitions, right? And then you don't even get the chance to apply your meta language because you, you know you you didn't identify the, those interesting things going on in the text semantically or syntactically. So, so that that that's one I think really interesting um, study. The the second one that I'll mention. It was a study again where they had good readers and poor readers, right? Predetermined, pre-tested to to sort them into those categories, and then what they did is they read uh, texts, and then after the fact, they uh, they were given the task of locating spe specific pieces of information in the text, and good readers were able to locate that information more effectively, and uh, you know you, you they basically. Um, they basically did ran other tests to see if maybe they just had better like spatial memory, right? They remembered where it was on the page, um, and and they showed that that actually that wasn't the difference. So that the good readers and poor readers had similar spatial memory uh, abilities, and so you know what they what they found is that it was actually the good readers um, were able able to represent the content of the text and you know in their mind more effectively so they had a better memory of the order of the actual events right not the order on the page or the location on the page but they actually held the order of events or the right the line of argument in in mind better right and so again the question what does this have to do with exegesis well you know i'm just thinking like like discourse analysis is such a, a trend right now um and people are seeing the benefits of it and and how helpful you know would this ability be for for the the purposes of discourse analysis or you know however you want to put it things that we consider you know exegesis um the ability to um read and hold the whole argument 
in your mind in such a way that you can you can go back through it you know quickly and effectively and efficiently to you know different pieces of the argument or the narrative or whatever i mean that that that's hugely beneficial for the purposes of exegesis right and again um you might people tend to think that the grammar translation method gives you the tools to do that uh, effectively through you know you know outlining the text diagramming the text and, and, and things like that but um again here we see that developing reading fluency um can can actually get you there in, in a much more effective and efficient way um so so finally just one last study this one this one's actually really interesting um basically they took um several groups of students and uh you know did, did some pretests to identify their starting point and then they put them through an extensive reading program which is, we've talked about extensive reading a lot on the on the podcast in previous episodes and and it's a, a an activity that specifically develops your reading fluency and um so so they put them through an extensive reading program and then what they did is they tested them not only on how well their reading fluency um, improved, but they tested them on grammar, just like straight up, they gave them a grammar test. Um, so the, the, the grammar test included things like noun phrases in isolation, verb phrases, subjunctives, subject verb agreement, tense agreement, right? Things that we, that we, that we associate, you know, with, with strong grammar skills. And, and, and so again, they pre-tested them on both their reading ability and their grammar competence. They put them through an extensive reading program. So doing extensive reading was kind of the only, um, you know, variable here. And then they tested them after the fact. And, and basically the results showed that extensive reading not only improved their uh, reading fluency su substantially, but also their grammatical knowledge. So, so in general, they performed better on the grammar test just through doing extensive reading, right? So, so regardless of how you want to say, you know, the, the grammar stuff, um, uh, it helps you with exegesis. The point is just the the, the very things that, that the grammar translation method um, are are trying to give us. Actually, you can see that even extensive reading, which which would be associated more so with the communicative approach, uh, again developing reading fluency, uh, that actually at least to some degree gives you those same sorts of things. So these three studies uh, all show that um, the the sorts of benefits that we maybe typically associate with the grammar translation method uh, again in some ways at least to some degree you're actually benefiting in, in those ways at the you know syntax and semantic level at the discourse level and just at you know at the the strictly grammar um, competence level you're getting those things from the communicative approach as well yeah yeah that's that's a great point and, and i think something just to keep in mind in this whole discussion is you know we are i mean in this discussion, pitting grammar translation against the communicative approach. Now that 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 has been a di dichotomy within the field, that really is a false one. I mean, it's you know, and again, like we've talked about the four strands on here several times. Um, you know, language focused learning is you know the grammar translation method basically. That whole piece. Of the four strands, that 25%, right, is devoted to focusing on features of the language, right? And obviously, you have to develop a meta language for that, right? And so, what what we would be saying, and you know, our our position wouldn't be get rid of the meta language, get rid of, you know, talking about the language, and that would be some people's position, right, within the communicative approach, just to say, hey, let's we don't really need explicit grammar instruction, you'll just begin to intuit all of it and you don't really need to worry about, you know, explaining what you mean um, or these, you know, meta language categories. Our position would be it's helpful to have both, right? But, but the issue is that within our, you know, within most seminary curriculums um, and just most ways in you know, textbooks and ways in which the, the biblical languages are taught, there's so little. There is there is there are so few exercises that are geared towards reading fluency, right? And, and reading fluency meaning you're reading texts on your level, they're easy to consume, 
and you're just consuming them like you would any other text in your own language, right? For the meaning. So, so that that kind of skill is not being developed. And I, and I think what we're saying here is, you know, do you need exegesis? Yes, right? Like it's helpful to have those meta language categories in some cases. Do you need to use those categories for every single word you come across in the text? No, you shouldn't be doing that. If you're doing that, then, you know, I mean, part of it could just be like the tradition that we've developed, right? But but part of it also could be because we don't we don't focus on reading the text fluently, right? And so we have to rely on these categories, right? And and this way of talking about the language instead of just using the language, right? And and that and that's where we don't want to be, right? What what we want to do is we want to be able to just read the text and understand it in in the original languages. And then we want to be able to use exegesis for the complex issues, right? For the for the issues that are really um, exegetically juicy, right? Where where I need to re- really have a good framework, a good linguistic framework, and apply that to the text in a way that you know helps us understand the meaning better than us being able to you know just read it with our, you know, hopefully near native reading fluency, right? That's the idea. Yeah, yeah. That's, and that's, that's a great way to kind of wrap up is coming back to those original questions we asked. The first one, does the grammar translation method or does a communicative approach help us do exegesis better? I mean, the bottom line is they, they each have a, their, their own contribution toward the task of exegesis, right? But it's probably fair to say the communicative approach is kind of gives you a more foundational skill of reading. And in that sense, it makes what you learn with the grammar translation method more useful. Like you're saying, like you're, you're not wasting those skills on, you know, parsing every word and, you know, things that you can just intuit if you're a fluent reader. But you can use those skills for the, like you said, the more co- complex issues the fun, the more fun issues um and things like that so so to that question they're both useful but um probably the communicative approach is more foundational um and the grammar translation method is something that you can really build on top of that with and do the second question should exegesis be our ultimate objective in the first place um again depends on how you define it but at, at the beginner level like beginner courses I, I would be tempted to just say no, that reading fluency really should be the objective. And um, and then exegesis, again, is something that you learn to do as a higher level skill on top of that. And so it could, it, yes, it, it should be our ultimate objective in learning biblical Greek and Hebrew in general. But for your first and second semester classes, I, I don't even know that I would say it, it should be the ultimate objective uh, for those particular classes. So... Again, you know, we we asked some pretty uh, difficult questions intentionally that that really require nuanced answers. Um, but hopefully, yeah, hopefully those are some helpful ways of of looking at them. Yeah, just going back to you know exegesis presupposing reading, right? If that is the case, then reading has to be where we start in our you know. Greek 101, Hebrew 101, whatever. You know, we have to get people to the point where they can read texts in those languages and and get the meaning out of them. They might not be able to explain with the meta language what exactly is going on from a grammatical or linguistic standpoint, but if they can intuit the meaning, that sets them up for doing that down the line. Right, right. Well, that is all we have time for on this episode of the Biblical Languages podcast brought to you by Biblingo. Thanks for listening. 